Welcome to Canada and to your new home in Ontario. For most of you, this is just the beginning of a long, challenging and rewarding journey. And we hope this program will help you. These first few hours at the airport may be a bit confusing, but the most important thing is to be prepared, even before you get on the plane. And if you're not sure about exactly what to bring, go to the website or ask people at the embassy or consulate in your country. The officials here are from the Canada Border Services Agency, and they have met thousands of newcomers like you and your families. They are here to help make your arrival as immigrants to Canada as efficient and painless as possible. The most important item to have with you is your passport, along with the customs declaration card that you will have filled out on the plane. The first people you'll meet are the customs officers. One of their main jobs is to prevent illegal items from entering Canada. So they will have very specific questions about what you're bringing with you. Border Services Officer Tanya Tardif explains. Some of the questions include if they have any firearms, any food products, any plants, pets, things of that nature. Do you have currency or monetary instruments over $10,000? No. Do you have any food products? Customs will also require a list in English or French of whatever goods may be shipped to you at a later date. Welcome to Canada. Thank you. The next group of people you will meet are the officers of Immigration Canada. Their main concern is you and checking your documentation. They should also have the landing visas in their passports. Other relevant documentation they might want to bring is birth certificates, uh, education, their marks, their diplomas, uh, marriage certificates, things of, these, of this nature. They should have two copies of the documentation and if uh, it is not in one of the official languages, they should have it translated to either English or French. Put this paper copy of the confirmation of permanent residence in your passport because your resident card may take up to six weeks to be delivered to your new address here in Ontario. And keep certified copies of all these papers with you at all times because they allow an individual who is not a citizen to come into Canada to study, to work, to play, in fact to live almost like a Canadian but without the actual Canadian citizenship. This is your husband and your yeah. children? With the confirmation of permanent residence, you cannot vote. But once you've met your residency requirements, you will be able to apply for citizenship. Okay, everything's in order. Oh, welcome to Canada. Congratulations. When you've finished with the official procedures, stop at the kiosk of this immigrant service provider here in the airport. They have information that can help you right away. And then, finally, you are officially in Canada, where friends or relatives may be waiting. In the next part of our story, you'll discover more about Canada and Ontario, and about the organizations that help immigrants. You'll find out about finding a new home in Ontario, learn about the educational and health systems, and see how to find work. One thing you can be sure of is that there's a lot to learn. Canada stretches across almost 5,400 kilometers and six time zones from here on the Pacific coast in the west to the Atlantic Ocean in the east and over 4,600 kilometers from our southern border with the United States up to our northern territories and the Arctic Ocean. Covering almost 10 million square kilometers, it is the second largest country in the world but its population is just over 33 million. Most Canadians now live in cities like these. But many of us have our roots in farming communities, and agriculture is one of our most important industries. Southern Canada is divided into 10 provinces. There are also three northern territories which cover a vast area, with very different terrain and a very small population. 
On our eastern coast are the four Atlantic provinces, with a mix of rugged coastlines, seaport cities and small towns, and beautiful countryside. Heading west up the St. Lawrence River towards central Canada is the French-speaking province of Quebec. This is historic Quebec City. And then on to Canada's second largest city, Montreal. Finally, we're crossing into the province of Ontario. But we'll see more about your new home in just a minute. Although our Aboriginal peoples have lived here for thousands of years, and are active in our modern life, compared to the countries that many of you come from, Canada is very young. But it has a history that we are proud to celebrate every year on Canada Day. Almost 500 years ago, explorers from Western Europe discovered the long St. Lawrence River and sailed into the wild heart of the continent. The French explorer Jacques Cartier was the first to call this huge country Canada. Over the next two and a half centuries, there were struggles between France and England to see who would eventually rule over Canada. But in the end, a classic Canadian compromise was reached in which the languages and cultures of both the English and French were, and still are, recognized as official. By the time of Confederation, in 1867, when we became a single country with our capital in Ottawa, much of eastern Canada had been settled. The West, however, was still wide open and became a magnet for immigrants from all over Europe. A new railway pushed across northern Ontario and Three Prairie provinces to British Columbia on the Pacific coast and helped build the country into one entity. Since that time, Canada has grown in population and international stature. Ours is not an aggressor nation, but Canada's military have fought with great valor in two world wars, as well as other international conflicts and peacekeeping missions. We have also become one of the world's leading economies. Our political leaders were instrumental in the founding of the United Nations. Canadian scientists have contributed important discoveries like insulin to world health. Inventors in Canada have brought us the telephone, the space arm, the blackberry, and basketball. While Canadian performers have risen to the world's stages, cinemas, and recording studios. Canada is a land of immigrants, and that is something that we take seriously. Some countries claim to be melting pots, where newcomers blend in. But Canada's philosophy is one of multiculturalism, a mosaic, where the country's original British, French, and Aboriginal cultures share the spotlight with the cultures of Asia and Africa, the Middle East and Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean. A Saturday morning trip to the outdoor markets of many Ontario towns quickly reveals a wonderful range of people and tastes from all over the world. The special thing I like about Canada is, is the multicultural. People can live uh, together with different cultures and people can understand each other and that's the greatest thing, I love it. There are so many different people following their own customs, religion, very peacefully. No one is bothering them whether you are a Muslim or a Hindu or a Parsi or a Christian. Everybody is leading their own lives very peacefully. One strong example of our multiculturalism is the fact that both English and French are the official languages of Canada. The Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario provide services in both languages. And though English is more common in the workplace and is spoken by most people in Ontario, there are a number of well-established French-speaking communities all across the province. The most important thing to remember, however, is that learning to speak at least one official language well will be a major factor in your success as a citizen here. Thank you. 
you want to get this language because this is the way you're going to communicate, this is the way how you're going to survive, this is the way how you're going to manage your business. Albert believes it's an advantage for francophones to be able to communicate in French and English since there are francophones all across Ontario and employers want people who can speak both languages. Another central part of life in Canada is the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees your rights even before you become a Canadian citizen. Every individual in this country is equal under the law, without discrimination based on your race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, gender, age or mental or physical disability. Among the most fundamental freedoms are the freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press. Citizens have the right to participate in political activities, the right to vote, and to be eligible to serve as a member of a legislature. You have the right to enter and leave Canada, and to live in any province or even reside outside Canada. But you also have a responsibility to obey the laws of Canada. Finally, a brief description of how government works in Canada. The fact is that every level of government in Canada is elected. From the smallest towns and territories to the ten provinces on up to the national parliament here in Ottawa. And every Canadian citizen 18 years or older has the right to vote in those elections. The country's national political leader is the Prime Minister, who heads the political party which has elected more representatives to the Parliament in Ottawa than any other party. That government makes and passes all federal legislation regarding Canada's national policies and international affairs. Here in Ontario, as in the other nine provinces, citizens also elect members to their provincial legislatures. The provincial leader is the premier, who leads the party with the most elected representatives. The provinces also pass laws which have to be obeyed in that province, along with the federal laws. In the next section, we're going to take a closer look at Ontario, its geography, its cities and towns, its different industries and businesses, and its four seasons. Ontario is the second largest province in Canada, and it is bigger than the United Kingdom, France and Belgium and the Netherlands combined. But what's just as impressive is how Ontario stretches from south to north, from the latitude of Northern California to the latitude of Southern Alaska. And within that piece of geography are vast boreal forests and thousands of lakes, plus fertile agricultural regions, not to mention cities, large and small. The province has the largest population in Canada and the people of Ontario work in many different kinds of industries and jobs. Over seven million of us live along the shores of Lake Ontario. Toronto is the biggest and most diversified city in terms of work. It is home to huge financial institutions and corporate headquarters, to service organizations and communications companies, as well as the healthcare sector, the film business and research institutes. Around the western end of Lake Ontario lies Hamilton, known for its steel industry and manufacturing. While further west are London, Ontario and Kitchener-Waterloo, both homes to large universities, high technology firms, the insurance industry and agriculture. Then on to Windsor and its automotive sector. Further to the northwest are the Great Lake port cities of Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay. While spread across the north, are the mining towns of Sudbury and Timmins. Back in the fertile agricultural east lies the beautiful university city of Kingston, right at the head of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And last but certainly not least, the city of Ottawa, 
the national capital region with its thousands of government employees and research firms. However, in all these Ontario cities and towns, the biggest employers are the small businesses of between a handful and a hundred employees. And we'll hear more about these people later. Most of Ontario's early immigrants were from poor working class families in Great Britain and Central Europe, looking for new opportunities. But our more recent arrivals have originated in China and India, Latin America, the Caribbean and Eastern Europe, in the Philippines and Pakistan, the Middle East, Africa and Central Asia. A significant number of them are highly educated in the professions and in business, but they too are looking for a better way of life. We had experiences of so many Pakistanis coming to Canada, settling over here, their children getting education, and they, they follow a certain system which I like very much. Everything is so systematic over here. The different lifestyle at the beginning could be not exactly what we expect, but in the long run, you, you, you know that you are in a very safe place. Canada made, it, made me who I am right now. I am proud to say that I'm Canadian, also Burundian, and among everything else, I'm proud to say that this is the country that gave me my first paycheck. But even before arriving here, a key question for many immigrants has been, where shall we live in Ontario? And then, what size of community would be best for us to settle in? Those decisions will depend partly on the newcomer's educational background and their work experience. But there are considerations. For example, do you have relatives already living somewhere in Ontario? And how do various towns compare in terms of employment, or schools, or health facilities? Sarita Bata Oja and her family from Nepal first settled in a suburban area, but that wasn't quite right for them. Like the when we leave, we start living there. Like I find, like I feel very lonely. Nobody to talk with. My husband was in Canada almost for two months. He didn't have any job, and it was difficult for me. Like, I can't imagine to get a job within two or three days. Employment was the major factor that attracted them. But their move into the centre of Toronto had other advantages, including having neighbours from all over the world right in their own building. Big cities like Toronto have the largest immigrant communities and immigrant support centres, as well as stores that sell the products of your home countries. They operate fine public transport systems and good public services. And big cities offer the most varied opportunities for employment, from a wide variety of service jobs to the most sophisticated financial, research and manufacturing work. But in the cities, competition for those jobs can also be fierce. And big cities are often more crowded and usually more expensive to live in. On the other hand, many of Ontario's smaller towns have the benefits of a more balanced lifestyle. The cost of living is lower, especially in housing, and there is greater opportunity to meet neighbours outside your immigrant group. You have the melting pot in Toronto that has a variety of different opportunities, but here in northwestern Ontario there's a lot of different opportunities that maybe wouldn't be in the southern Ontario uh, core, but are unique to our area. That's what Bernardo Villega and Ludit Granadillo found before they even left their home in Venezuela. He decided to do a little research here in Thunder Bay, and uh, he found that we could have a high quality of life uh, for the family. And uh, even though it's, it's a very small city, we had everything here. You got community center close to your house that can provide you with that entertainment during the summer, winter, all, all year round. And uh, to be able to, um, for my daughters to go to activities like gymnastics, swimming, and uh, you really need time. And uh, time here is what you really have. As you can see, deciding where to live in Ontario depends very much on individual preferences and opportunities. And it requires careful thought. 
Deciding where to live may be a bit easier for French-speaking immigrants, since there are fewer towns in Ontario where French is common. But there is a sizable French community in Toronto, as well as in Ottawa and across eastern and northern Ontario. Some French-speaking newcomers, like the Bizendavi brothers and Hervé Namidar from Burundi, chose larger English communities for the English immersion. Guy Bizendavi, who now lives in Toronto, says that if you live in an English-speaking place like this, it's easier to learn English here. It has helped him, and he is continuing to learn. Hervé Namidar in Ottawa says this is a place where you have opportunities to work. The people in the government support you. Everyone gives you a chance. But let's get to what you may have heard about Ontario's weather from your friends and relatives. First of all, it's not always winter. David Phillips of Environment Canada is probably the country's best known expert on the weather. I think it's, if you wanted to sample all of the Canadian climates, come to Ontario. We've got, um, uh, certainly we're, we're not the, the coldest, we're not the hottest, uh, we're not the snowiest, we're not the wettest. There's nothing boring about the weather here in Ontario. Well, as long as you're ready for it. Trust me, winter also it wasn't easy for us at the beginning, right? But after a second year, it started to be really fun for us. We went skiing, we went tobogganing, we went like on a, to resort in the north. So the snow becomes also fun for us. Being prepared for winter makes all the difference. That first Canadian winter is always a shock. But David Phillips offers some very sensible ideas. We spend more money on clothes people in Ontario than any other part of the world. And it's not because we're fashion conscious. Hey, we've got a lot of weather. And there's no question about it, winter can present some challenge. Pay attention to the weather forecast and, and have in your clothes closet enough materials to, uh, to make you comfortable for any kind of uh, situation. It is a time to enjoy the outdoors, uh, to get out and about. And if you're well clothed, if you're attuned to what the weather is, Hey, it can be a, a day blessing and not cursed. Coming up next in our program is information about the immigrant support agencies in Ontario. It can help you and your families deal with some of the challenges and surprises that you may face. All across Ontario, there are many service provider organizations for immigrants whose goal is to help you integrate into your new communities. Just please make sure to bring your permanent residency documents. Some of them help people who come from one region of the world. Others serve newcomers from one particular religion or language group. While still others serve a very wide range of immigrants or concentrate on helping people find work, you can find most of them through these websites. Many of the staff members and counselors in these organizations are immigrants themselves who are happy to share their own experiences with newcomers. They are especially helpful with refugees and immigrants who are having a hard time adjusting to this new environment. Since most settlement agencies are well supported by both the Canadian and Ontario governments, most of the basic services and advice that they provide are available free or at little or no cost to you. At Ottawa Community Immigrant Services, the executive director is Hamdi Mohammed, who was born in Somalia and earned her PhD in Canada. Her group provides a range of services that is similar to other large settlement agencies across Ontario. The range starts with initial settlement support when individuals come uh, seeking information on housing, health services, immigration law, uh, accessing other resources in the community, getting to know where the schools are, um, that's settlement. Then we have multicultural liaison officers uh, in other parts of Ottawa who are multilingual, multicultural, 
and they provide uh, similar settlement services, but within the context of school. Every range of newcomer services we've tried to house under one roof so that once you come here, you're connected and you're connected within the job search programs, the, the translation of your documents, registering your children for school, what you need to know about immunization in Canada, taxes, driving, all of the different things that you might need are, are provided here. Refugee services, assistance for how to apply for a in social insurance card or an OHIP card. How can I help you today? Yeah, I need a passport. All right. Yes. It all happens in this building so that newcomers can become familiar with coming here, feel comfortable here, feel safe here, and know that their needs will all be met here, that they don't need to really find agencies all over the city doing all of the different pieces of what they need. Earlier in our story, you heard about Canada's Charter of Human Rights. But along with those rights, which extend to every member of your family, you also have an obligation to respect Canadian laws. Among the most important are the laws against domestic abuse, particularly against women, children, or older members of the family. Domestic abuse, um, child abuse, and any sort of violent crime towards any person is a crime and should be reported immediately. Self-destructed abuses, like drugs, alcoholism, or gambling addiction, can also destroy families. But there is help available from reliable sources, like the immigrant support organizations, and groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and Gamblers Anonymous. Like some of our laws, relations with the police in Canada may be different than in your home country. No one is expected to know every single law in Canada, but some offences, like stealing, assault or selling drugs, are obvious. There are also consequences here that newcomers should understand. For example, if you are caught stealing and convicted, you will have a criminal record, which could make it harder for you to find employment. That crime or whatever is happening doesn't continue and somebody... However, for the most part, the main job of the police in Canada is to protect and serve their communities. That's what Ottawa officer Medeiros is doing here with a group of newcomers from the Caribbean. In Canada, we serve the police service, we're not the force. We are the service, we provide the service. Police officers are not allowed nor is it accepted to take any sort of bribery it's completely unacceptable uh, we are expected to do our job in a professional manner and conduct it um, in a way that is respectable and in an ethical manner and don't ever be afraid to ask the police for help when you need it wherever you need the police you need the ambulance or fire service we all respond by one phone call 911 Drinking alcohol is legal, however, drinking and driving and being intoxicated in a public place is not legal. It is a crime and it does carry a punishment. With your eyes only, do not move your head. Follow with your eyes. If you are found drinking and driving, you could potentially lose your license, face time in jail and also be uh, charged with a fine. One thing to watch out for is people sometimes even from your own community, who may take advantage of your inexperience in the systems of Ontario. And whether they contact you in person or by phone calls or on the internet, that can sometimes be criminal fraud. You might have heard the stories about unscrupulous immigration consultants swindling vulnerable people. That happens all too often. Now, Radio Canada's investigative show, Enquête, has uncovered another troubling trend. One that could but even people with the best intentions can give you bad advice. Le grand défi des gens qui viennent de nos pays, c'est que... Patrick says that the risk for many newcomers is to only seek information from within your own community. You may be more comfortable with your own people, but they may not have enough information to guide you correctly. Patrick recommends that it's always better to go directly to those organizations which specialize in helping immigrants.
It must be said that you may meet Canadians who have preconceived ideas about your culture or your home country, especially when you first arrive. And you may have similar preconceived impressions, not only about Canadians, but about other immigrant groups, even those from your own country. You should have an open mind and uh, you should also leave your ego back from where you came from. Uh, I think uh, that will solve about uh, 90% of your problems. Albert says there are always some barriers when you come from another culture, and it is likely that through some people's ignorance, there will be some prejudice. Emma Tang spent her childhood in China and missed out on much of the popular culture that her Ontario classmates grew up with. Environment. I didn't know Sesame Street before I came. I didn't know Baywatch. I didn't know Hamlet and um, Shakespeare. I learned that all here, being exposed in school and, and outside. It takes time. We, we have to realize that when you leave your country and you come to another country, there are hardships you have to face. And if you're prepared for that, then you will get adjusted very quickly. One of your biggest challenges, no matter where you choose to settle in Ontario, is finding a home to live in. As newcomers, you have two main options, other than living with family or friends who are already in Ontario. The first option is to buy a home or a condominium, while the second is to rent an apartment or part of a larger house. In either case, there can be a very wide range of prices. During their first years here, most immigrants do rent, usually in an apartment building, with the payments due at the beginning of each month. It is a good idea to visit several different places before making a final decision. For example, you may want to compare rental cost versus the distance from your work or to your children's schools. And in most cases, the building manager will ask for a deposit in advance of moving in, plus one or more references. Both of these are accepted practice in Canada. If you have no references, don't hesitate to ask for advice from your local immigrant support group. They are used to helping. This is a very beautiful kitchen. In most rental apartments, there are usually major appliances, like a stove and a refrigerator, and some buildings have shared washing machines and dryers. However, it is not very likely that there will be any furnishings or carpeting, as Sonia Diaz found out. I remember when our friends say, okay, this is your apartment, everything was empty, we only have a, a mattress, two mattress, like for my kids and for us, and that's it, everything was empty. You may be able to borrow some basic furniture from relatives or have some shipped from your old home, but it is fairly certain that you will have to deal with the next big adventure, which is shopping in Ontario. For many newcomers to Canada, shopping can be a bit confusing because it takes on so many different forms. This is morning in one of the huge indoor shopping malls near Ottawa, which will be filled with people in just a few hours. There are shopping centers and supermarkets like these in every good-sized town across the province, and they sell a huge range of products. They are also good places to shop in when the weather is bad. It was crazy, <laughs> yeah. I remember. We yes. spent uh, almost four hours. And you, you have everything from clothing, uh, photograph, food, everything. It's huge to one end to another. It's like a 200 meters. You had to start from the beginning and you had to check every aisle. You had to read every single label. However, there are many, many other shopping options. In many locations, traditional open-air markets are very popular, and they sell fresh food from spring through autumn. Neighborhood stores still serve local customers, and food shops often carry specialty items for different immigrant customers. 
Many Canadians also shop at bargain stores like this one, which specialize in selling good second-hand clothing and housewares at very low prices. For newcomers who are just settling in or still looking for work, shopping at these stores is especially helpful. However, no matter where you shop, getting used to sales taxes in Canada may take some time. When Patrick Bizendavi went to a supermarket for the first time, he got quite a surprise, because the price on many of the products he wanted did not show the government sales taxes, which are applied to every purchase. There is no doubt that finding a place to live and good stores to shop for food and clothing are very necessary first steps. However, to benefit from the Ontario health care system, or open a bank account, or drive a car, or get your kids into school, it is absolutely critical that you all visit a Service Canada Centre in your area and get a social insurance number, and then visit a Service Ontario Centre for key provincial services. Neither visit will be very complicated, but you'll need to bring your permanent residence card and your passport. Welcome to Canada. Thank you. Ontario's health insurance plan, known here as OHIP, is one of the very best in the world. There is a three-month waiting period, but once you have the proper identification and your social insurance number, many basic medical services are available at low cost for you and the whole family. However, unless you have additional private insurance, you will have to pay for prescription medication. When you arrive in Ontario, you can go directly to a local clinic at any time. They operate under different names, but are listed in the local phone book. You may also want to find your own family doctor, but that may take some time. In the case of a serious accident or illness, you can go directly to the emergency ward of the nearest hospital in your area. It is all covered by OHIP. But one important thing to remember about healthcare in Canada, it is gender and racially neutral, which simply means that you may be treated by male and female doctors, nurses and medical technicians of every race and culture. As well as the good healthcare in Ontario, our major Canadian banks have proven to be among the most reliable in the world. They are also very approachable and they definitely want you as customers. May I just have your playing card, please? Thank you. For example, it is both easy and very safe to set up a savings account with any of them. All you need is proper identification and your social insurance number. They can also help you get a credit card or a debit card. Banks also make personal loans and mortgages if you are buying a house. Okay, thank you. They also make business loans and will help you establish a line of credit. In fact, many banks offer valuable assistance in setting up your new business. Uh, sorry. You will also find that many of the employees in our banks are new Canadians themselves, and there is often someone who can help you in your own language. For many newcomers, getting started in Ontario will also involve buying a car. However, this is a very diversified market with a lot of high-pressure salespeople. Used cars are always quite a lot cheaper, but they may have a very short warranty or hidden damages. Before buying, check out the reputation of the dealer and the type of car with as many knowledgeable people as you can. New cars, though more expensive, usually have excellent warranties. New car dealers also offer different methods of payment, including long-term leases. But again, do a lot of research and be sure you understand the details in the contract. But even before you start shopping for a car, many of you will first need a learner's permit, then driving lessons. 
Only then can you take the official provincial driving test to get your Ontario driver's license. As Fernando Innocentio says, driving here may not be the same as back home. Some people uh, used to say to me, like, well, if I can drive in Bogota, Colombia, that is so really, of course I will be able to drive in Canada. I would say, no, it's totally different, the opposite. In a, in a third world, crowded city, you are trying to survive in the traffic. Here, you follow the rules. Good turn. Another thing about living in Ontario is how different our cultures may be not only between you and the established people of Ontario, but between your group and immigrants from dozens of other cultures. This is a delicate subject, but it is important to understand how some of the daily behaviors and personal practices you have grown up with may leave an incorrect or negative impression with people in your new home province. For example, people here will likely be offended if you push into line, stare at them, or stand too close. In Ontario, you're expected to dress properly for job interviews and show up on time for any appointment and shake hands firmly. Your new community and colleagues will be more comfortable and your chances of success will increase if you speak clearly, look people in the eye, and smile. As Emma Tang said earlier, it is simply a matter of taking time to get used to this new culture. Sort of like modesty. Um, in China, it's um, perceived as, um, I don't know, good to be very modest. So if people compliment you, um, you generally would say, oh, no, I'm not that good. I'm not good as you think. But I think in Canada is, or in Western society, it's it's, it's great to express your potentials and uh, be open and uh, willing to accept praises. Hamdi Mohammed says getting to know your neighbors is also important, especially for new immigrants with children. People take for granted that your neighbor is going to help you through all the challenges that you're facing, including dropping your child at a neighbor's house to go to work or something coming up. So uh, it takes a while for people to recreate that community. So that, that initial period of uh, saying, what do I do with my children when I'm working? Who takes, who picks uh, so-and-so from the bus and, and how do I deal with that? But with a little patience, most newcomers to Ontario and Canada have adapted to life here without much trouble. The children of immigrants fit in especially quickly. And as their parents, you have to understand that they are becoming Canadianized. It is a completely normal part of living in Canada, but it doesn't mean that they will lose the culture that they were born into. And as they grow into adulthood, living with two or more cultures will prove to be an advantage in Canadian society. Coming up next, the all-important subject of education in Ontario. Education in Ontario starts early and can continue on for much of a person's lifespan. And there is no doubt that education offers proven social and financial value for everyone. Throughout Canada, education is a responsibility of each province, and the various English and French language school boards around Ontario are publicly funded. As you will see, there are different schools for children of different ages, but all boys and girls between six years and 18 years must attend school. There may also be private and religious schools in your area, and the same rules apply, but these schools may not be free. We'll get to the colleges, universities, trade schools, and adult education in a minute. But let's start with your smallest family members. For younger children, up to age six, Ontario has a variety of childcare and preschool programs. They are not free, though some are subsidized. Check the websites and brochures for more information about the area you are living in. 
But when it comes time for your child to enter the elementary or secondary school system, you or a legal caregiver must first take him or her to be registered. And it is a good idea to do this as early as possible. You'll require paperwork which proves the child's age and that she or he has had the required immunization for certain diseases. Elementary schools, like this, have classes from kindergarten up to grade six or eight. Their classes include basic mathematics, history and geography, and literature. And there are often immigrant settlement workers who act as liaison between the school, the student, and you, the parents, providing settlement services and information for all three parties. The same kind of help may also be available in secondary and high schools. In most Ontario high schools, the classes are from grade 9 through grade 12, and the students are learning more about the sciences and advanced mathematics, as well as Canadian studies, the arts, literature and music, computer science and French, among many other options. Most high schools also have activities after regular classes are over, in sports and music and specialty clubs. One of the main objectives of the high schools here is to prepare students for further education, which may be at one of Ontario's 19 publicly funded universities or community colleges or trade schools. Students need very good grades to get into larger universities and colleges like this. But once they are there, the range of courses open to them is huge. Equally important, Having a degree or certification from one of these schools can lead to significant financial and social benefits later in life. In China, school is sort of restricted on what you learn, but in here, I'm exposed to a lot of new ideas, people from different parts of the world, uh, world issues. Um, so I'm more alert to um, things going around me. And so a lot of opportunities to, um, to learn and to explore and to reflect on myself and uh, stay motivated. Canada as a, as a country which will give me a lot of opportunities in the future. Whichever field I want to take, like, education is great. I'm not saying that the education back home is not great. Education back home is good as well, but it's just a, it's just a very good experience coming to Canada and uh, learning from the society and cultures, learning the good things. As well as its universities, Ontario funds 24 colleges of applied arts and technology and is home to over 500 private career colleges. Some of these schools teach skills that are much needed in the healthcare sector and information technology. Now, this boat has some weight, but you have to subtract that weight. Huh? Yes. So you again... Some concentrate on the construction industry or automobile mechanics. Students in other colleges learn about business and manufacturing. At Ottawa's Cité Collégiale, a French community college whose students specialize in a variety of technical trades, Albert Kayumba is an instructor. He points out that the college has many specific programs. Their focus is on the practical, because the labor market is looking for qualified workers. The students spend a lot of time in the laboratories but they also do job training out in the workplace. It's really a complete program. So when they start looking for a job, these graduates have real experience in their specialty. The college collaborates with employers, first to arrange work placement for the students, and secondly, to advise about the tools and equipment that are found in the workplace. So students get training on equipment that they will find out in the real world. As well as their programs in the various trades, the college also has programs in healthcare, the arts, media and communications, administration, more than 85 in all, and in French. Another part of learning in Ontario is adult education and retraining. For people 18 years of age and older, there is free basic adult education which will let you earn a high school diploma that is required for most jobs. 
These classes are often available after work hours. For many of you, however, being able to speak English or French fluently and clearly is truly the first critical step in adapting to life in Ontario. There are language training classes like these available all across the province, and many of them are free. Among the most effective are the federal government's LINK program, short for Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada, and ESL, or English as a Second Language programs, offered by the Ontario government. This LINK class is being held in Toronto and has students from many different countries. Many LINK classes also offer childcare services. The classes use both computer-based training and personal instruction. It may not be easy, but learning the language is worth the effort. I learned a lot of things because my English was very poor. So I learned every single day a lot of words, a lot of grammar, English, everything. Still, I have a lot of trouble with my English, writing, reading, but I think that I feel better now with my English. Classes like these, in fact, all forms of continuing education and training, will very often make the difference between success and failure in Ontario. I have a friend of mine uh, who just did a 14-month course and whom, I mean, uh, who would expect that within 14 months of language in Canada you get a 100,000 plus uh, uh, package. It's amazing. So there's no limits if you put your efforts. As you heard earlier, Ontario has the largest and the most diversified economy in Canada and accounts for about 40% of the jobs in the entire country. Three quarters of those jobs are in the service sector, which includes financial services, such as in this bank call center, as well as health care, retail, tourism, and the public or government service. The remaining jobs are in what is called the goods producing sector, such as manufacturing, agriculture and construction, and the resource industries like mining and forestry. But Ontario is also closely connected with the global economy. And because of that, your opportunities for finding employment in these sectors may change from year to year. So, learning about the labour market in your community, today, will help you decide what kind of work best suits your skills and your expectations. Ontario's diversified economy offers many, many opportunities for newcomers. For instance, our society in Ontario is getting older, uh, and that means that more people are using healthcare services with many, many opportunities and demands uh, on the healthcare sector. Albert points out there are always houses and buildings and roads under construction. And it's certain that the housing developers, even the government, which is investing money these days in infrastructure, will need qualified workers. But no matter where the opportunities might be, and no matter what type of business they may be in, actually getting that job does involve challenges. First, you'll need to do a lot of research on the internet, at your local immigrant services organization, or Service Canada, or through the Employment Ontario program. Once you've identified a job you want to apply for, you will usually have to write a resume that describes your relevant qualifications and work experience. You may also need a cover letter that explains why you would be an asset to this particular organization. Plus, references from past employers. Make sure that you have all your official documents available. And maybe even practice what you're going to say. I worked out a speech about myself <laughs> when I was first starting. And, you know, to say what I do and, and I'm a newcomer and any help you can give me. And, but you have to be forthright. 
Being honest about your abilities, experience, and education is critical. Employers will find ways to check references for key jobs, and an applicant's honesty about his or her abilities, combined with a positive attitude, can make all the difference. So if you don't mind me asking, the first question I'd like to ask is... But the fact uh, is that newcomers who use the immigrant service organizations have a significantly higher rate of finding a good job. We do provide job search workshops matching individuals' newcomer skills with uh, Canadians who have similar uh, skills and, and knowledge. The idea is to, ma to have an individual support that connects you to networks. You can keep applying, applying, but you're just one in the millions of uh, applications. But if somebody you know recommends you and um, puts in a word, that's good enough. It can lend you a good job. I know in our organization, people will come in and, and be surprised when they leave that well, there's so many opportunities I didn't realize. That, well, we're not advertising them all, but you have to know the right people that can identify these opportunities. So I think that's, that's very important. But the most important thing in finding work is to keep trying and stay positive. And if you can start building a network of contacts in your chosen industry, all the better. Under the laws of this country, men and women have equal rights, and those rights extend into the workplace. Almost 60% of women do work outside the home, and they account for 47% of the total workforce. This may be quite different from some traditional cultures, and it may cause problems within immigrant families who have just arrived but it is totally accepted and respectable in Canadian society. Under our labour laws, there are also mechanisms for men and women to report cases of unfair payment, discrimination, or abuse, or unsafe working conditions to the Ontario Ministry of Labour. And employers cannot fire or intimidate employees who ask about their rights. One thing you will notice about working in Ontario is that you get your paycheck at the end of the pay period. For example, after one or two weeks work. And the amount may seem to be lower than the salary you were expecting. That is because there are certain regular amounts that your company must deduct from your paycheck to cover things like your income taxes, contributions to the Canada Pension Plan and to employment insurance, as well as things like union dues and other benefit plans. It is all perfectly legal, but you must be given a statement that shows what all of these deductions were for during that particular pay period. For newcomers looking for employment in certain regulated professions, such as engineering or accounting or medicine and healthcare, special qualifications and documentation and retraining are almost always required even if you've practiced as a professional in your home country. Some continuing education programs, like here at Ryerson University in Toronto, offer retraining in careers like physiotherapy, social work, and accounting or finance. And you're going to do the actual clinical exam with Roger. These newcomers already have accreditation in their home countries but they must now learn Canadian practices and procedures in order to qualify for a license in one of Ontario's professional organizations. The courses, which are part-time and often at night, last from 12 to 18 months. However, after this young accountant from China passed his final exams, he was able to start as a fully accredited junior associate in a well-known Toronto accounting firm. Joseph. For trained immigrants in other professions, it can be more difficult. You'll need help, most probably from Service Canada or an immigrant service provider organization. We have an office called the Foreign Credentials Recognition Office, which aids newcomers in order to get their credentials recognized. But a little bit of research before you come to Ontario will mean a much easier transition into the regulated labour market in Ontario. To earn accreditation in medicine and dentistry can take quite a lot of time, effort and re-education. 
and you may need to start working here in a lower position, such as a dental assistant. Dr. Fernando Innocentio, a dentist from Colombia, has been through the accreditation process himself, and he now helps other professionals. Every profession that is self-regulated here in Canada has their own rules. Many of them would uh, require you to do your training in an approved university, so it's not going to be easy. If you are not from um, those uh, institutions, uh, you will have to do retraining here. Becoming a qualified engineer in Ontario has a different set of criteria. This is the Mississauga Office of Access, a government and business funded agency that helps skilled newcomers to Ontario find work. We're in the second day of a six week course designed to help these experienced immigrant engineers become familiar with Canadian engineering practices and regulations. It will also help them find work and eventually earn their professional accreditation. One of the success stories from a recent course is Sabrajit Singh, a telecommunications engineer from India, who found an excellent job at Harris Technologies. This uh, program actually helped me quite a bit, so I was able to focus my job search. I was able to fill out quality applications and all. And my past experience was quite in sync with what I, I would be doing over here. While most immigrants, in fact most Canadians, want to find a job with a good, reliable paycheck, there is a small but ambitious percent who want to start their own companies. These small and medium-sized businesses are a critical part of the Canadian economy, generating up to 64% of all private sector employment. But going into business for yourself has risks as well as rewards and it takes more than dreams and desire to succeed. Opportunities exist in many different sectors in Ontario. But for these entrepreneurs, there are three basic things to understand from the start. The first is to do research in advance in the sector they want to get into and find a support team of experts in the industry and a financial advisor. Second, they need to take the time to figure out the challenges and barriers they're going to face on a daily basis. And third, in Toronto's busy Chinatown, bank manager Wendy Sato describes the third critical factor. Lastly, the most important thing is to have a business plan in place. Um, when we say a business plan is to have a written business plan in place because studies have shown that uh, entrepreneurs that have a business plan in place are more successful than the ones that don't have one. And that's simply because they're more prepared that way. Mohammed Abu Qasim from Palestine was prepared. He managed to acquire one of the best known franchises of all in Ottawa and now owns three of them. Uh, the start usually in the first 10 years, it's not easy, it's tough, but that's where you get the biggest reward. But again, uh, nothing is easy in life. Apollo Kamani arrived in Thunder Bay from Kenya and teamed up with his Iranian partner, Vahid Sadeji Aval, to open Angelo's Pizzeria. Both businesses are in the food sector, but the lessons they have learned apply to nearly all entrepreneurs, especially when they are getting started. The most stressful aspect was you open up during your first days and you're like, oh, you know, it's not getting busy. Sometimes you're scared. You have like an hour or two hours with nobody walking in. The biggest success is the flexibility of owning your own business, flexibility on time schedule, the ability to participate in the community uh, and financially a bit more rewarding than being an employee of the month waiting for the salary at the end of the month. We just had to persevere and get, be dedicated and be ambitious and just go ahead and do it. The tough lessons learned by foreign-born business people like Mohammed and Apollo offer similar lessons for all immigrants to Ontario. Both started with a vision for their future. Both worked very hard and figured out ways to overcome the obstacles in their path. And both have kept on learning about their businesses, their customers, and their communities.
We know there has been a great deal of information for you to absorb in the last hour. However, there are excellent websites and printed material available, as well as the different government agencies like Service Canada and Employment Ontario, plus all the fine immigrant support agencies all across the province. They are there for you, so don't hesitate to use them at any time. You are free to live and work in any province or territory. There are many positive things about moving to this country and eventually becoming a citizen like these new Canadians. As well as the personal freedom that living in Ontario offers, there are fine schools and hospitals, a strong and modern economy, and one of the most ethnically diverse cultures in the world. But there are also challenges, both real and perceived. Finding the right job for you often takes time and a lot of persistence. There are new systems of education and health and financial matters to learn. And there are new customs to get used to in Canada. And perhaps some of the old customs to put away. Well, congratulations, félicitations, you are now Canadian citizens. Many, many immigrants have come before you, and most are willing to help you find your niche in Ontario society. Many more immigrants will follow in the future, and you will very likely help them fit in. It is all part of living day to day in this great place, Ontario, Canada. <laughs>